about, about what's Trump. happening with Trump. I love it. Uh, well, I wanted to get started. We had a conversation a week ago kind of about what we wanted to talk about and get through here. But kind of set the stage uh, in terms of the political conversation here about what it is that you and your organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, do. You've been there since 1993, so you've been there through a lot of changes. That's right. Our job is to make sure that the internet works for users, um, that it protects users, that it frees them to say what they want, that gives them space to innovate. Um, that takes us to certain places, um, especially uh, around civil liberties, around the Constitution, how the Constitution and the constitutional rights, um, or in the international specter, the International Declaration of Human Rights, how they interact with what we all do online. So, um, What might be one of those big fights? I mean, you guys are involved in the thick of kind of some of the most controversial political arguments of the day. Absolutely, from the beginning of the internet and the, the idea that the internet was a place of free speech, which was something that we helped make happen. Um, in the last, for the last 10 years, I've been trying to get the NSA to stop spying on everybody and to stop <laughs> no, no. Tapping, into the, uh, tapping into the internet backbone and, uh, and, 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 and watching all the communications as it goes by. That started under President Bush, went through the Obama administration, and now we have uh, Mr. Trump, and we continue, uh, we continue to try to scale that back uh, step by step. We've made some good progress, but there's still a ways to go. So we are just over 100 days of President Donald Trump. What grade, from your vantage point, would you give the Trump administration so far? Well, I think with regards to tech, it's got to be kind of an incomplete. Um, <laughs> Uh, because I think that the things that have been front-loaded by the by the Trump administration have not have have only hit tech um, indirectly. Um, the biggest one and the first one I think is the changes at the border, where we're seeing many more uh, stepped-up efforts by the border agents to demand people's devices and search people's devices and to demand people's passwords. This is something that the was floated at the end of the Obama administration. It was something that we uh, participated in uh, conversations with the government about. Um, but the numbers have just shot through the roof since Mr. Trump's been in office of the number of people who are, uh, whose devices are being demanded and their passwords are being demanded. We're also seeing that at political protests, so the, the inauguration protests. Uh, many, many, most of pe many, many people who were arrested, including journalists, had their devices seized and their devices were not given back to them until they handed over the passwords. So um, whether it's the border or protest activity, the first thing that I think really hit tech pretty clearly, um, in addition to the immigration ban, which has a, a collateral effect on tech because so many people in tech uh, are international folks. Right. Um, but the, the core kind of hard tech stuff was really stuff at the border and stuff involving uh, journalists. What's coming up next is network neutrality. Right. Uh, the, the new head of the FCC, uh, Mr. Pai, was uh, one of the opponents of network neutrality. Um, and now that he's been uh, put up into the chairmanship, he's doing that as well. Um, also on the FCC, the FCC at the end of the last administration passed some privacy rules that limit what your ISP can mm -hmm. do with your data um, that Congress just repealed at the request of uh, Chairman Pai and then uh, Mr. Trump signed. So these are kind of the, the things that are starting, mm -hmm. um, but I would say it's incomplete because really the full agenda of things that candidate Trump said he wanted to do that would affect people in technology, we're really just starting to see uh, the start of that. So let's peel back the layer a bit in terms of the passwords and the border and, and things that are happening at some of the protests that we've seen across the country. What are you guys doing? How do you get involved in this, uh, this, this area as some of these cases might start to be coming up? Well, the first thing we've done is that we put together a toolkit called Surveillance Self-Defense mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and also tools for people going to protests about how to best protect yourself. Um, how do you lock your device? How do you make sure that you're limited? Maybe don't take your device thinking about how much of your life is available on this little Thing that you carry around each day and do you want to make that vulnerable or not and how do you protect it. Um, also, we do trainings with groups who want to learn how to protect their organizational information as well. Um, and we are building a hub for people who want to do trainings. A lot of people in tech really want to know what they can do to try to help people 
who are resisting um, uh, attacks on their civil rights or civil liberties. Um, but a lot of technologists don't really know how to teach mm -hmm. technology very well. So we're trying to develop better resources. So just because you know how to use PGP uh, may not mean that you're really good at teaching other people how to use it or how to do other things to protect themselves. So we're putting together resources for people who want to teach and trying to help connect people who want training with people who know how to teach them pretty well. So that's one of our big endeavors. We're also collecting stories of people who've had their passwords collected at the border, or their devices searched at the border, and we're looking for a good test case mm -hmm. because we think that the Fourth Amendment ought to protect, to protect you um, where you are mm -hmm. and that the fact that you are crossing a border shouldn't mean that you have no constitutional right, that the government needs to have a good reason before they take your device and they search your device. Right now, they don't need to have a good reason. They don't need to have any reason at all. We'd like to fix that. So talk to me about net neutrality. We were talking about that uh, as one of the biggest issues that when we saw the fights. This was a massive issue uh, for many years and kind of seemed like it was settled law. Mm -hmm. And now under the Trump administration, that is clearly no longer the case. Uh, the, the courts have upheld that net neutrality is legal, but the FCC has said, and Trump's administration has said, they will continue to fight against it. That's right. The, 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 uh, a fuller panel of the DC circuit just on Friday upheld the FCC's network neutrality rules that were passed uh, under the previous administration, but nonetheless, uh, the new FCC chair says he's coming after the rules. Um, it's gonna be a huge fight. It's something where I think anybody who's coming to this conference who wants to start a tech startup ought to be very concerned about it. You know, the, the network neutrality is the idea that ISPs can't sell access to their customers mm -hmm. to uh, websites or services that want to reach them, that the, the internet technology is neutral and so today's Craigslist and tomorrow's Craigslist both can be accessed by people without AT&T and Verizon and Comcast basically selling access to their customers. Picking winners and losers. Picking winners and losers, favoring their own content, favoring the people who pay them extra money in order to make things load faster or load better. That's what a neutral internet gives you. So if you're a startup and you think that you're gonna start on a neutral platform of the internet and that your technology or your service is gonna survive based on its own merits, that's the case if we have net neutrality rules. It may not be the case if we don't have them and it means you've gotta go strike a deal with AT&T, strike a deal with Verizon, strike a deal with Comcast so you get access to their customers. So. We have been one of the leaders in right. trying to make these rules fit, um, and we're gonna be standing up with a whole lot of people to try to make sure that they don't get repealed again. Um, people here who are in startups, there is a sign-on letter that our friends at Engine Advocacy have that's aimed specifically at startups and talks about the need for people starting entrepreneurs needing to have a neutral platform um, instead of having to play payola that we would love to see people sign I think that if we're gonna win this issue, it's going to be because the startup community has their voice heard and raises their heads up and, and, and makes their voices heard because that's the future. You guys are the future of technology and if you can't get a start without having a huge bankroll so you can do the payola, we're, we're all gonna suffer. We're gonna have less cool stuff. And you know, I, I'm not in favor of any particular startup. I'm in favor of a world where more cool stuff keeps coming <laughs> at us. Uh, How, and do you th expect this? Is, I'm, I'm, you know, live and breathe the Capitol Hill. You know, I'm up there most days uh, in Washington. Where are you seeing lawmakers? Are they starting to get involved in this? Is this going to be something that you see, you know, kind of, I would expect a lot of companies and industry groups, but also potentially some big advocates on Capitol Hill. Who do you see as kind of the champions on your side of this issue? Well, certainly uh, Senator Wyden has been a champion. Senator Markey has been a huge champion of this. Um, uh, you know, I think that if it... Uh, the 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 tricky part is going to be to get enough Republicans. So the the Dems are pretty good on this. There's a mix, but they're pretty good. Um, but getting a few Republicans to say, you know what, I need to stand up for small business here. I need to stand up for the entrepreneurs and the next generation of people. We, you know, the Republicans 
um, need to be the party of innovation, not just the party of you know, feeding more money to the old guard big companies. And I think that's a message that will resonate, but it's why I think it's really important that the people who are here mm -hmm. are the future of technology. And if you don't make your voices heard, believe me, they're not, it's not going to magically happen. Members of Congress will respond, especially to this community, if you make it known. The nice thing about Collision is that it's not just Silicon Valley, right? There are companies, we're here in Louisiana, there are companies from all over the country. You all have senators and representatives um, it's important that they, they hear your voice, that this is something that, you know, we need a level playing field uh, in, in tech. And what are you seeing, you mentioned privacy. Talk to us a little bit about what, what's so far happened and maybe your concerns going forward. Well, um, one of the big mass surveillance programs that I've been trying to rein in for the last uh, few years um, is, is authorized under something called Section 702 of the Feist and Amendments Act. You're going to hear a lot <laughs> about 702 going forward. And in your head, just think 702, oh, that's the government tapping into the Internet. Uh, that's the NSA tapping into the Internet at, at key switching stations in the United States. That's up for uh, renewal. It's going to expire at the end of the year. Uh, we have a really good opportunity between now and the end of the year to try to get that reined back in again. Um, and um, I, there's some indication, you know, Mr. Trump has not been the kindest to the national security people. Um, so there's an opportunity there again. If people make their voices heard, mm -hmm. uh, we might make this issue one they don't want to take on, uh, make it a little too too hot mm -hmm. for people to take on, and maybe maybe they'll. Um, rein in those programs a little bit. So that's a big one about privacy because I think that people deserve to have a private conversation when they go online. I think that's how activism happens. People want to organize, they want to change their government, they want to change their representative. They need to be able to have a private conversation where the government can't be listening in order to make that happen. So to me, it's tremendously important, not just for personal privacy, but for free speech, for being active, being part of uh, changing the political landscape People need to be able to organize, and I think that's really important. I, I also think it's important for security. I mm -hmm. think that having a secure internet means not having an internet that has weak points where somebody's listening in as traffic goes by. Those weak points are generally they, what get compromised. Um, so security and privacy and free speech to me all point in the same direction, which is a, an internet that answers to you and has strong security. So we're seeing that. Privacy is definitely one of the issues Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Trump hasn't said much about mm -hmm. privacy per se. Um, it's an interesting opportunity for him to show that he actually stands with real people and not just with companies, big companies. Um, so far, it's not particularly heartening. I mean, he campaigned as if he was going to stand with regular people. Well, I think regular people want privacy. Mm. They want to be able to have their data not be breached and be at risk and spread out over the world. They don't want foreign governments that can tap into databases and get private information about them. So there's an opportunity for uh, Mr. Trump to step up and kind of make a stand with ordinary people. Um, but if he doesn't, we're going to have to make our voices heard anyway. Talking about privacy goes kind of leads us into the conversation about surveillance something that we talked about behind, backstage. Uh, he recently had some comments uh, to CBS's John Dickerson where he kind of stormed off. Uh, but he's talked a lot about his, you know, the own surveillance that he believes happened during his campaign. Where did, the, I mean, this is something that you focus a lot on. Can you read the tea leaves of where Donald Trump is on this? Well, I, I think that would be very dangerous. <laughs> uh, I won't try to psychoanalyze where he is, but one of the things that, um, I think gives a, a, a nugget, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think that he was specifically targeted for wiretapping. Uh, I think that's been pretty clearly, uh, uh, lots and lots of people who've looked into it said that that did not happen and that is not true. On the other hand, uh, but the government is collecting lots of information about communications that Americans have with people overseas. Uh, they believe that's something that they get to do free of the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there's lots of people in Trump Tower or, or in the Trump ambit who are talking with people overseas, maybe even people who are targets of the United States government's surveillance. So you could imagine a situation in which those communications ended up in the NSA's giant storehouse of communications that they keep and then they search through. and they. They argue that once they collect that information for a legitimate purpose, they can search through it for any purpose, you know, for, for a much wider range of purposes than just the reason they collected it. 
um, and Americans' information, many, many Americans, far more Americans are in that bucket than foreigners mm -hmm. are. Um, that's research that came out, the Washington Post did uh, some work out, out of the Snowden documents that, that demonstrated it was about nine Americans for every one foreigner in that bucket. So if you go searching through that for someone, you're gonna hit Americans, and you may hit prominent Americans. Um, so I don't think that what he said happened, happened, but I think there's far too much power in the control of the NSA and far too much ability for them to get access to the private communications of Americans so that even if that didn't happen, it's important time for us to look more closely at what kind of um, surveillance infrastructure have we built and are we comfortable with the rules? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not comfortable with what they call backdoor searches, this idea that if the government collects information from one purpose, they can then search through it for other purposes without having to go back and get a warrant for the new purpose. They don't have to justify the second purpose. I think that's wrong and inconsistent with the Constitution. It's one of the things we've been trying to tee up in a court case. Right. Um, and, but the government's claims of secrecy have really bogged those cases down. So we need to, we need to start addressing it as a country. I wanted to Kind of, we're running out of time here. It's a really short amount of time, but I wanted to talk about. We have a lot of tech startups here, obviously. And one of the biggest issues has been dealing with companies, the different approaches they take about keeping information yes. and tracking information. And then what the government can often come after you know the information that you have from your customers. What's your advice to how either the best practices or how you know a startup should handle this kind of inquiry when you know you're probably focused on just trying to do their business and much less fight the government about turning over information? Well, I think that there's a couple of things that we really emphasize. One is think about what data you're collecting and whether you really need it and how long you need it for. Because um, you know, to quote Kevin Costner, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> If you have a lot of data about users, sooner or later law enforcement's gonna come up and they're gonna start asking for it. So I think you need to have a rigorous process for deciding what information are you collecting, what are you using it for, how long are you keeping it, and get rid of it. Don't keep stuff you don't need. It's, I, I've watched people go through the heartbreak of realizing that they have all this information on their customers and law enforcement comes and demands it and they have to turn it over because they don't wanna be in contempt. Mm -hmm. Better to not have it. My, my, my good friends and my clients at the Internet Archive, for instance, run one of the largest Internet sites in the world. They do not collect data on their, on their users. Um, that may not be right for your business model, but it's the kind of thinking that will be helpful to you. The second thing that we ask people to do is to stand up for your users when the government comes knocking. Uh, we have a whole system that we do every year called Who Has Your Back? where we have a list of criteria for companies for standing up for their users, whether that's fighting gag orders. I represented Credo Mobile mm -hmm. and Cloudflare in the last couple of years, standing up against gag orders. Microsoft's challenging gag orders now too. Um, giving notice to your customers when you can. Um, writing a transparency report so you tell the world how often the government's coming and looking for your users' data. We use that information to make the case to Congress and to the in the public case that the government's gone too far, so help us by helping us get the information we need to make that case. Um, there's a whole list of them, we do them every year, and if you're a company that's interested in these issues and you wanna be able to do it, you can certainly do, it's very transparent, you can do everything that we rate and say, yeah, we're compliant with what EFF says in terms of who has your back. We don't do endorsements, but you can say that you endorse us. <laughs> there you go. We're about to get the hook, but I want to ask you one last thing. We've had 100 days of Trump. Project for the future, the next 100. <laughs> what is the one thing we all should be watching in this space uh, that you know, you're going to be focused on pretty squarely? I think there are two things. Sorry, I'm going to ask you a question <laughs> too. First is network neutrality. That was announced on Friday. It's clearly going to happen. It was the biggest thing that we've done as a net community was to stand up and demand those rules, and now we have to stand up again and fight them. We can do it. We can make this something that does not get rolled back. We have this in our power as a community. If people stand up and do it, you know, we, 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 we made the net go black the last mm -hmm. time. We can do it again. Second to Sopa Pippa, it was the biggest outpouring of support for ordinary people. We could do that again. The second thing is the reauthorization of Section 702. I know it sounds geeky, but it's pretty straightforward. It's our internet. The government shouldn't be tapping into the backbone. Perfect. Well, Cindy, thank you so much, and thank you guys for having our conversation.